Hi, this is Jeff. Before I begin, I just wanted to say that I am aware of how uncertain and scary the times are right now. Theatrical runs have been canceled, postponed, shortened. Auditions have been canceled or postponed. Film festivals have been canceled, and it's been really tough on a lot of people. And I just want you to know that I'm thinking about you and that I love you. I do this as a labor of love and I will continue to do it for as long as anyone will sit down and interview with me. So that being said, this week I am talking with Michigan talent agent Rob Winkworth. In this interview, we talk about the ups and downs of being an agent, one of the craziest things Rob has ever had to cast, and the one thing that will ruin your chances at any audition, and much, much more, so stay tuned. I, like, so if someone walks into the audition room and they, I, I hear the words, I really want this role, that I can pretty much guarantee that person will not get considered. And I took more pictures of Torsos. Torsos. Independent. Hello. Right. My name is Jeff Tavakis. <laughs> How are you? I have a mouse though. I really want this job. Hello and welcome to Michigan Theater and Film Talk, the interview show dedicated to highlighting Michigan and film talent from all over the state. Hello, my name is Jeff Tamakis. If you are new to this video, um, or these types of videos, please go to my Facebook page, which is um, Michigan Michael Chekhov Classes M2C2, and like that page, and you will be the first to be notified of videos just like this. I am also on YouTube, which is at Michigan Chekhov, two words, C-H-E-K-H-O-V, and go ahead and subscribe and like and share these videos with everyone you know, have known, or will know for the rest of your life. Uh, as well, um, I am on podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts, and if you are listening to this on a podcast, please leave a review and a rating. That would also be extremely helpful. My guest today is Rob Winkworth who is a, a talent agent at uh, a local talent agency here. Can I name it? Or sure. the, the, the iGroup. And um, it's very exciting to talk to you today. Yeah, I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah. So um, uh, let's begin at the beginning. What, what, is, your, what is your background? How came, how came you to the art of being a talent agent? Yeah, nepotism. Actually. It's a family business. <laughs> nepotism <so>. is awesome. <laughs> so, uh, my uncle um, acquired the company about 25 years ago. Okay. And um, I was a teacher at uh, the Roper School as a middle school teacher and a coach for many years and had a summer off. What did you coach? I coached basketball and soccer. Yeah. Okay. So, um, <laughs> and uh, I had a summer off, and my cousin uh, Tony, who's in the the lead agent currently at the I Group, mm -hmm. was looking for some assistance, and I offered it up, uh, and have been there ever since. So. And and uh, do you think it's the biggest mistake of your life, or? <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah. I very much enjoy it. So, yeah. yeah. And how long have you been there? Um, it feels like 11, 12 years, something like that. Yeah. 11 or 12 years. Yeah, yeah. So, so you've, you've seen the ups and downs and the ins and outs of the Michigan. Yes, the, the kind of mm -hmm. the ending of the union era, probably be a way to describe it, when automotive and union work was so strong in the mm -hmm. Detroit area, was dwindling really when I started, and then the film incentive kind of kicked in for a while there, mm -hmm. right after that was kind of dipping, and then that went away and have seen kind of the scenario that's followed yeah and cool. how things have changed yeah so um let, let's go back in time yeah. to uh what was it like when you when you first started at the i group as far as um the the union auto sure. uh, uh the, the like those presence. types of yeah. presence um yeah. i mean how many people would you place at, at any given time or you know sure. yeah it was, um, I mean, I, I probably would think of it as in form of like percentage of bookings or auditions mm -hmm. or things like that that we saw. Um, we were probably like almost 50% of our work was uh, was union based, mm -hmm. most of it in industrial or voiceover, mm -hmm. um, some of it in commercial. I mean, as far as like kind of economic value, by commercial was a greater percentage of it, but mm -hmm. a lot of industrial work, spokesperson work. Um, whether it's like on camera or doing like industrial um, narrative video, mm -hmm. audio and stuff like that. 
Um, and then, I mean, really within the first two years of me working there, that really dropped probably to about, you know, like 40% and then 30%. Why was that? Was it the strike? Was there a strike or? There was a strike in that time period. Mm -hmm. There, But really the influx of new media and how that changed way video, the way video is produced, how quickly it can be produced, and how cheaply it can be produced. Well, hence the... Right. The thing I'm doing right now. Exactly. Right. right. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely pushed and created the need for talent that works at a lower wage, at mm -hmm. a lower wage. I'm pretty sure that's kind of like one of the basis of it. Mm -hmm. That you could produce things so much quicker, you wanted to produce things so much quicker and so much cheaper, and the need for, you know, really professional talent and disciplined talent went away to some extent. Because um, it was cheaper to produce, and it was they, cheaper could, to produce they could yeah. burn more film and burn more. Right. I see. And kind of make things happen much faster. The union, as wonderful it is, is expensive. It's mm -hmm. not a cheap endeavor to hire a union actor. Mm -hmm. um, and you, but you get a lot of this. Union actors are definitely kind of another layer, specifically of discipline and, and performance and professionalism and all of that. Um, and that's changed over time. Is kind of like everybody stepped up their game mm -hmm. uh, because the non-union market has is really grown in Detroit. Um, but producers were willing to kind of make that sacrifice. Things were shorter. Things didn't have the same demands of performance. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that just radically changed things. And the union gradually moved out of Detroit. There's no more, no longer union office representation here. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's still a local and there's still, you know, kind of members of the board and all that in Detroit, mm -hmm. but there's no longer an office here, for example. So, oh, wow. Yeah. So that all happened within, you know, the first kind of five to six years of my me working in the industry. How did the iGroup react to this? Were they like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Or... I, we, I mean, fortunately, we got replaced by non-union work. Yeah. Um, so that was a nice thing. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't, it didn't drastically change the way uh, we needed to survive, but it did drastically change the way we kind of depended on the business. I, one of the things that goes away when you lose union work to non-union mm -hmm. work is residuals, mm -hmm. um, which are a big thing. You get a union job every 13 weeks, you would get another check because yeah. the commercial ran or whatever it was. There was always that payment. Um, and that produced a lot of work. Non-union work doesn't really have residuals. The, the contracts there are usually longer periods of time. The new media world produces things so much faster, they don't keep things mm -hmm. for long periods of time. They just make a new one. Kind of yeah. Thing. So it's, um, we end up producing more work in the non-union so we're disposable now. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, we're the curing cups of talent. <laughs> it's very much become that. Yeah, yeah wow. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that makes me uh, laugh and cry at the same time. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Um, so fortunately for you and for us, um, the film industry came in yeah. at that time. Right. And, and uh, what kind of films did you, uh, and what kind of roles did you um, help with uh, casting at that time? Sure. We, I, well, we submitted on pretty much anything that came through. So, mm -hmm. um, like Youth and Revolt was a big one, and then mm -hmm. Whip It, and uh, the Batman Superman things, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Or even the smaller, the smaller films. We were definitely a part of those and submitted to those. One of the things that happened then is casting directors are one of those things that Detroit doesn't have. Um, we didn't have them then. Uh, mm -hmm. We then, have like, how many casting directors local do we, do we actually really have? have. Uh, I think Janet Pound's the only kind of working casting director yeah. at the moment. Uh, and even that, it's she's got, she does limited work. Mm -hmm. um, just because there's no work. Mm -hmm. um, but we didn't have any casting director entity in Detroit. And then when the film incentive came, there was a demand for that. The industry demanded there to be casting directors. Mm -hmm. And so they came in. And so in a casting director world, any agency you all submit your talent. Mm -hmm. So the, the, we had to learn that process and kind of figure out how to, how to succeed in that world. But we were able to therefore then submit on every film that came in the area and be a part of any film. So what happened when the film inside of went away? Was sure. it the same kind of type of situation as, as the other? It, it definitely, it, I mean, to be completely honest, as an agency, the film incentive was to some extent, I mean, it was great and wonderful and we were mm -hmm. happy for our talent. It really was a lot of work for not a lot of money from, it, from as an agent. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, it, it would, you would invest an enormous amount of time for 10% of a day player role. Um, mm -hmm. 
that maybe you get and maybe you don't because they're the way the casting director world works. They may not pick from your agency. They may pick from somebody else. They're drawing from some... You don't control the way the economics are going to fall mm -hmm. whence talent is chosen for something. Um, and so it was difficult to kind of justify the amount of time that we spent on getting actors into film and getting roles for, for people. Did it economically kind of always work out for us? Not, not all the time. So once the film incentive went away, it really didn't affect our business that much. Oddly enough, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So. That, is, that is not something I would have thought. Right. And we're also very dependent on commercial and industrial work. Uh -huh. So it's like that, it was a percentage of our... Mm -hmm. Time, but it was like literally the, t the cost. You had already uh, had a business model which which relied heavily on the commercial, right. and and so the the film was an extra for you, but not necessarily the. It was like right. gravy, maybe, and not even that. that. I don't know. If it was gravy because it took a lot. <laughs> it takes yeah. a lot of time. To, yeah. To be uh -huh. from the agent side of it and the casting side of it, film and TV takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. Um. You have to see a lot of options. There's a lot of roles. They have to be auditioned. They have to, the process, and especially for union things, there's just multiple, multiple steps that take a lot of time compared wow. to the commercial and industrial world, which goes faster, and then the non-union world, which goes faster. There's not as much paperwork and all that other good stuff that goes with it. So I don't know when the film incentive with it affected us. It definitely affected acting, though, and it definitely yeah. affected the enthusiasm, and it had that kind of other... You know, it brought passion to things and it brought uh, a lot of energy into mm -hmm. what we did that wasn't economically tangible, but mm -hmm. was definitely, you know, acting tangible. I think it's, mm -hmm. everybody got excited about character and performance. And there's we started to develop, I think, in a lot of ways, a discipline about performance that went away when the film incentive went away. There was mm -hmm. a friendly competition and people were fighting for roles and they got better because of it. It, mm -hmm. it, it brought some great things to performance and to acting that when that incentive went away and while it didn't really make a big difference for us economically I think it really did make a big difference for us as far as enthusiasm and energy for what we did and what the industry was let's let's go to uh, the talent that uh, that you and, and and by talent we mean actors um, uh, or models Right, it was for us, right. for for you, uh, or voiceover artists, or whatever. How do you get to be uh, on your roster? Sure, I, mm -hmm. it's it's pretty easy, <laughs> relatively speaking, as far as um, we just at our agency, and I think kind of with competing agencies in the area, it's pretty much a, a submission via website uh -huh. of a of a picture and a resume, like an industry resume, if you have one. Um, mm -hmm. It's not a professional resume. It's not like what you would get it if you were getting a job somewhere. It's different. Mm -hmm. You know, it should reflect kind of the th theatrical work or on-camera work or entertainment-based work that you do, um, and that's it. I mean, e expressed interest in a decent photo are kind of the ways to get even considered within an agency in the Detroit area. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's a question from our standpoint of whether you're a good fit in our roster, and and how do you determine that? It it's looking at. Um, kind of where we need people. I mean, that's that's what agents are always thinking about. So so uh, actors are a type? Yeah. And you're like, I need, we need this type right now. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's grossly stereotypical. I mean, we, yeah. we look and say, okay, we need more people in the 20 to 30 male uh -huh. um, range kind of thing. And we kind of look to see if whether we have good um, demographic representation within that 20 to 30 male range. And we make sure we have those people. Yeah, I mean, roster. my my demographic would be average Joe. I'm sure. average average Joe, American dad yeah. type type of guy. I've gotten a lot of work where I've had to um, paint my chest in some in some fashion <laughs> for sports sure. for some sports uh, or, or sports like organization or uh, just been the you know they put the uh, average Joe in an uh, unusual situation and and that would be my type right right, right. and uh, and it's, it's important for an actor to know oh yeah his type yeah your brand your type I mean, mm -hmm. those are those are absolutely essential pieces more so in the more competitive the market the get it gets to mm -hmm. um, like you Jeff are gonna be able to kind of cross over in brands in mm -hmm. Detroit more able than you'll be able to do it in New York or LA or something like that. You'll be mm -hmm. pretty well branded and threaded in there. 
Mm -hmm. um, but there'll be gaps in certain brands in Detroit that you mm -hmm. may float over into and get other opportunities that would exist in there that, that wouldn't exist in those more competitive markets. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you, getting comfortable with that is definitely a difficult step for an actor. It's mm -hmm. not... Um, I, I teach a little bit of that, just kind of like creating comfort with it, um, learning how other people see you and how you're perceived in one second of time on camera. What is the stereotypical reaction when someone sees you? What do they think you are? Have you um, ever had to have a conversation with an actor and just say, look, you're just not like, they were like, why aren't you submitting me to this? And you look, you're... Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. Yeah, I've had to have that and in numerous different ways and numerous different um, reasons. But it's, yeah, it's very important that someone learns <laughs> to accept that. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, so you slap them. This is <laughs> you're not you're not that type. Right. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, as an actor, you feel like you can play any type too. I think that's one well, of the that's one of the joys of being an actor. Mm -hmm. like that idea Acting of, is transformation, right. and and sure, but uh, for film, yeah, camera don't lie, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, you have to learn how to accept. You, you can't put like age makeup and make right. it look really convincing even in the best situations. Right. I mean, these days they're getting better, but a few companies have like a million dollars to spend on CGI right. to, they're, they're <laughs> to make gonna, you look old. Right. And they're not going to do it on, on you. Right? They're yeah. going to do it on Robert De Niro or they're going to do it on whoever that's, that's getting that money to get that opportunity. Mm -hmm. You're, you're going to play within the constraint of who you are. Mm -hmm. and how people see you in that moment. And that can be difficult to accept. Um, I get it. I mean, it, I, we all have difficulties accepting kind of certain things in our lives, so I think, it's an act, <laughs> I think that can be very hard. Um, and then learning how to flourish within that constraint is mm -hmm. the other big challenge about how that, what that means for you and, and how to, to kind of be disciplined and, and approach that. It's like you have to you know, earn your way through that constraint before you get the opportunity to do things that are maybe more fun or more challenging or more unique. Constantly. Where do you make your money sure. as, an, as a talent agent? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's Detroit's unique to mm -hmm. some extent, um, mm -hmm. but in a, in a larger market, an agent takes the money from the talent. Mm -hmm. Exclusively, that's it. Mm -hmm. um, we got between 10 and 20%. You mean, um, you mean they get money from, like, the, the talent pays you? To... I, basically, I mean, huh? this transaction can occur depending uh, on what okay. it is, that if you're the actor and you got paid by the job, mm -hmm. and then you have to come and pay me. What if they didn't get a job? Would they pay you without work? No. Okay. Yeah, not an a, a okay. an agent, a, a legitimate agent, only gets. I think that's a, what I was driving at. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A, a legitimate agent or a SAG and after franchise agent only receives a percentage of work that you get paid for. Mm -hmm. So if um, if you get a job and you get a thousand dollars for for being on set, and mm -hmm. my percentage cut of getting you that was ten percent, then you're you want you to get paid your thousand dollars. So the client pays you. You take your cut. Right. Or, or is there is there a difference? Sometimes they pay you. Really? They give you a thousand bucks, and then you have to come give us our hundred dollars at our commission. And that do you come with a lead pipe and say, "Where's my money? <laughs> Where's my money?" Once in a while. <laughs> and then we have this Italian bank. But, uh, we um, uh, that really doesn't happen. That's uh -huh. that's usually in union work mm -hmm. and when the commission isn't being removed from the check before mm -hmm. it's sent to you. Okay. Um, but. In Detroit, typically speaking, production pays us for the work that you did on a job, and then mm -hmm. we take our commission out and then issue you a check mm -hmm. um, for whatever percentage it was that we had agreed upon. Mm -hmm. So um, usually we get to kind of process the money and handle it, so we don't have to track people down mm -hmm. uh, for that. But again, sometimes it works. Sometimes it, in, in, in union work, the money goes to you and the commission is owed to us. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We have this one actor who is who's wonderful about it, and she gets these residual checks, mm -hmm. um, and they're like thirteen dollars or something like that. So she comes in every once in a while and brings us our thirteen cents or whatever. <laughs> and that, but that's the dis that's a wonderful discipline about kind of what it means. And, and yeah. Well, I, yeah, I think it's a chance to to say hello to you. Right. Really absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Agencies are very transient. People are always moving in and out of them because mm -hmm. of. How we're handling money, and then auditions, and just kind of a variety of different things. How does a a, a talent keep on your radar? I mean, how many talent do you have? Uh, we have a ridiculous number compared to like again what's going to be in a, a smaller market for film and TV. We have mm -hmm. about four thousand talent in mm -hmm. our in our roles, but that includes models and promotion workers mm -hmm. and film and TV and commercial and industrial, commercial. 
commercial work requires having a large number of talent available. You, have, mm -hmm. you never know what the criteria of any specific commercial are going to ask for. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to be able to provide that. When we do film and TV work, often those things are very specific. And in larger markets, agents kind of work in very specific worlds. So they only, mm -hmm. like a film agent or a TV agent, may only have 100 talent that they represent, kind of, mm -hmm. or 200 talent, while I'm in charge of 4,000. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, it is important, really important, especially in Detroit, to make sure that we're thinking about you. Kind of mm -hmm. like the smaller market, it's really mm -hmm. good when you start as a talent to occasionally send an email when you're in new talent just to mm -hmm. say, hey, I'm here, don't forget about me. Um, mm -hmm. Keep us updated on the things that you're doing, like training and classes and mm -hmm. got new headshots or whatever that work is that you're doing as part of, of mm -hmm. being that professional actor. It's great to know those things as we get used to having you in our group. Mm -hmm. um, that's not necessarily going to be true for all agencies and all agent work kind of thing. But mm -hmm. in the commercial world, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's pretty important to kind of say, hey, I'm here, I'm working, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm focused. It's like a once a month thing, though, too. Um, mm -hmm. A check-in kind of thing. Just, you know. I'm alive. I'm, I'm still alive. here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm still in town. I've right. moved away. Yeah, and you guys haven't sent mm -hmm. me anything and for whatever reason. I mean, Detroit mm -hmm. is a very seasonal right. market. Note to self. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if you're getting auditions and you're, and you're getting called in for stuff, that's mm -hmm. not necessary. That's, mm -hmm. not a, that's not a requirement. But sometimes you just won't at the beginning of your relationship with an agent. It's, mm -hmm. It can be somewhat disheartening if you don't get a call or it goes three months and you haven't received an, an audition mm -hmm. notice. Is it mm -hmm. okay to send an email and say, hey, I'm here. Mm -hmm. I've been taking some classes. It's great. We yeah. to know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. What? What? At what point does that become annoying? Um, <laughs> like any sense of desperation and yeah. the person wanting work, right? Under trying to feel that th that becomes very difficult because I mean we don't unfortunately make jobs for anybody. We mm -hmm. we create opportunities when maybe someone gets chosen. Um, it's difficult to kind of to to f create work. Mm -hmm. for people kind of and in, in, in that regard so when it feels like desperation when someone needs the work that becomes too much that would be kind of like the global way of saying it mm -hmm. i feel like i'm communicating out of desperation and i should probably stop mm -hmm. um the uh from like a time perspective like more than once a month is too much kind of thing it's okay probably, yeah probably yeah uh-huh okay i mean if that if that makes any sense but i think that relates really to the idea of desperation can you give some examples of like a particularly desperate person or something like that? Oh, yeah. sure. It, would happen, it happens in auditioning mm -hmm. a lot. Okay. Um, yeah. I would say that like the, I, like so if someone walks into the audition room and they, I, I hear the words, I really want this role, that I can pretty much guarantee that person will not get considered, unfortunately, because they're performing with, with the idea of that there's value in that role, mm -hmm. that there's a sense kind of... That someone else has power in that, right? That the, it, it, it's a weird choice, but mm -hmm. once they come in with that desperate sense of I really want this or I really need this, um, their authenticity is gone in their performance. The way they treat the opportunity mm -hmm. to audition in that moment is lost, um, and really, what the role of auditioning is lost, I think, in that point as well. Um, I think, you know, as you say that, I, I think of my early years, mm -hmm. you know, in my early 20s, just, uh, you know, starting out with agents. And um, I mean, there was like, there were things that I thought, this will change my life. Mm -hmm. This film will change the trajectory of things for me from here on out. And what I've learned over time is that opportunity always knocks more than once mm -hmm. and that there's no such thing as a, as a role that will change right. change your life really. I mean, that, well, I guess that's not true. I guess there are certain okay. certain roles that will completely change your life in certain opportunities, but, but you'll get that opportunity again. Right. And um, I remember being in, in those auditions and just like sweating bullets. You know, and it doesn't take much for me to sweat because I'm Greek and I sweat by hoping I don't sweat. Um, so uh, I'm like sweating and, and, and trying to be authentic and trying to be real in the moment. And it just was not possible for yeah. me. Um, and, and for me, I, I have to constantly remind myself, you know, keep a, act with a feeling of ease, feeling of ease, feeling of ease. That's the essential thing for me mm -hmm. on camera. Um, 
what are some uh i mean what are some some interesting auditions that you've had to audition people for you say that you have to keep a large pool of mm. talent what are some interesting calls that you've had to make um we uh i mean there's kind of a variety of interesting answers to that question. oh well i want them all so <laughs> the uh we had we were doing an um a commercial i think it was a commercial yeah it was a web-based commercial for depends mm -hmm. oh and apparently depends are worn by a lot of younger people these days for like concerts and just a variety of other reasons and so this was a pitch for the wearing of depends from the like 25 to 40 crowd of people that wear them um, okay i didn't think that demographic existed sure, but it there does. it is <laughs> i've learned very much so um and the video was there was no face in the video it was literally just kind of like knees to to nipples kind of thing and not even that much but just seeing someone in there depends and then like a, a shirt being thrown over it or a dress falling over it uh -huh. like that's it um so we had to find models that fit and filled out the depends um and i took more pictures of torsos torsos in depends um <laughs> <laughs> and I took, for each actor, it was like 12 different pictures because we needed different angles and seeing how the butt filled in the depends and all that other stuff. Oh my gosh. That was not, not necessarily the most challenging audition, <laughs> but as far as one of the most unique auditions. You're that, like, I'm, uh, this is my living. Yeah. This is what I'm doing for a living. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I can see that. Mm -hmm. um, and the other, I think the other side that came out of that, though, what I gained a lot of appreciation for is that it had nothing to do with anything important for people like mm -hmm. in their lives as an individual your ability to get that role was based on what we had figured out was like if you had the right hips to butt to thigh ratio of measurement of whatever it was mm -hmm. would enable you to fill out the depends better than anybody else mm. So, so now you know for future depends. Yeah, more or less, right? <laughs> yeah. it ever comes I got up that. There. Put that in the old filing cabinet. <laughs> but it was like such a phys It was like so physically based. And uh -huh. It was so beyond anybody's ability to control it or even like train for it. Like, mm -hmm. There's nothing you could have done to train yourself to get that role. And it was a good role. It was like paid five thousand dollars or some ridiculous amount of mm -hmm. money. Um, because of what's being featured, and that was an important part of the actor being protected and all that stuff. Um, but that, you know, it had nothing to do, they could, there was no performance involved in that mm -hmm. um, to be an actor that fit that. I, I remember, uh, you know, I, it was one of my first jobs after I moved to Michigan the first time. So mm -hmm. this was like maybe about 20 years ago. And, uh, and they were like, bring your weird talent. And that, that was it. So everyone did weird things. And my and this thing that I, I could do that I would uh, annoy my wife with almost on a regular basis was, was this, <laughs> right? So I could clap with one hand. The sound of one hand clapping, that's the sound right there. And, uh, and, and Kaj and my wife, would, you know, I'd be in a bar or something, would, and she'd, be, she'd just, you know, uh, want to hide her face. Right. And, um, and then I got a union job because I could do that. Sure. And it's funny, now she lets me do it whenever I want. <laughs> but <laughs> now I don't want to do it because it's no longer annoying to anybody. But, but I'm like, oh, yeah, I have a, uh, at, at the time, I just had my bachelor's degree in fine arts. I was like, yeah, I have a college degree in acting, <laughs> and this is what got me to work. And a lot of times that happens, right? right. You, know, you, I, you know, I have a master's now, and I'm like, I have a master's in acting. And sometimes I feel like uh, that's actually a negative in auditions sure. right mm -hmm. it can absolutely be mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah it can it's i think in in the commercial world it can really be mm -hmm. um and i'm sure if like you kind of bring that as an element of who you are to an audition hello it, right my name is jeff Tavakis. <laughs> how are you i have a master's i really want this job <laughs> it might really work against you yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. yeah. that's a terrible audition <laughs> That concludes part one of my interview with Rob Winkworth. Stay tuned in a couple of days for even more. See you guys soon.